people who care about the humanities a lot, I think, are very grateful to you for having written your book, Not For Profit, uh, which made the case for the importance of the humanities in the context of American democratic life. You've recently redone the preface to that, and I wanted to ask you, how are the humanities doing now, in your view, and have things changed substantially since you finished that book and the moment when you took up this new preface? Well, I guess I was pleasantly surprised when I started looking at data. Looking at data not just uh, of majors, which there is some reason to worry about, but data of total enrollments in humanities courses. Big increase in community colleges. That's really interesting to me. And in adult education, a huge upsurge, which is not that surprising because I think humanities um, respond to people's searches for meaning in life. So it's not surprising that people who have been working hard and then they want to pause and they want to think about what life is all about. So those things I found very interesting. I was also very happy that my book has now got company, Fareed Zakaria's excellent book, Michael Roth's excellent book. So I think there are lots of voices now speaking up. What I also learned in the process is how lucky we are in the United States to have the liberal arts system. Because in most countries in the world, if you go to university, you have to decide all English literature or no literature, all philosophy or no philosophy. But since we have a system that has two parts, one part is general education and one part's your major, you can plan. If, you're, if your parents say you got a major in computer science, you can do that. But you can also, and you should, I think, be required to, take general education courses in humanities that prepare you for the larger job of being a good citizen and having a full life. So we better cling to that system because it's what's made the humanities really uh, survive and strengthen themselves in the United States. So how do you think we should cling to it in, in the following way? As I travel around, and I do travel to many colleges and universities, I've, I've sensed a, a, some weakening of that resolve to offer that liberal learning aspiration for higher education. What should we be doing, in your view, to reinforce that way of thinking about the aspirations of higher education in this country? Well, I think there are really three points that you can make. Uh, the one that I make, and I think we should put front and center is the crucial role of the humanities in preparing people to be good citizens. The role of critical thinking, analyzing arguments, the role of expanding the imagination to come to grips with the way a person experiences life who's quite different from yourself, and the role of history and, well, I'll include the social sciences here, in making it possible to really understand the complicated world, the interlocking world that we're in. So I think that's the first point. But there are other things we can say. Business leaders actually love the humanities because they know that if our business culture is going to continue growing and innovating, to innovate you don't need skills that you learned yesterday by rote. You need a trained imagination. And so all over the place I encounter business leaders who are saying STEM is okay, but really, we also need the humanities and particularly the imaginative aspect. We also need healthy business cultures that have criticism and dissent. Uh, when there's a culture of complacency and go along to get along, then bad things happen and businesses implode and, uh, and uh, whistleblowers are discouraged. So I think that's the second general point that for economic growth, we need the humanities. Singapore and China, which certainly don't want to encourage democratic citizenship, still are building the humanities. And that's very interesting. They've had major educational reforms. And it is all about building a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. Then the third thing is um, just the search for meaning in life. I mean, life is about a lot more than what you're earning your living at. And people at all ages need to start thinking about a meaningful life or else um, when they get to be in middle age or when they're verging on aging, you know, they'll suddenly realize 
my life is feeling empty, but I haven't even begun to reflect about what life is for and what it means. So I think all those three points can be made. I made the focus on citizenship largely because I think I can reach out to people who don't already care about the humanities, who don't respond to that call for meaning, and they can see that if we want a political culture of informed dissent and civilized argument, we really need the humanities. Some people who care about the humanities and uh, wish for its success have also worried about some of the trends within the humanities. And there have been criticisms leveled at some humanists for recent developments intellectually within the humanities as having been discouraging of expansive student interest. For example, the critique of certain more obscure methodologies, deconstruction has come in for some criticism, and difficult language attached to some expressions of humanistic work. How do you, how do you think about those criticisms and what are, what are your views? Well, I do think there's a lot of bad writing. And I worry about that in philosophy. I worry about it even more in literary studies because I think there's perhaps more obscure and gimmicky writing. But I actually wouldn't blame it on any one methodology. I think the issue really is that we, when a profession is protected by academic freedom and tenure, it tends to turn inward. And to a large extent, that's good. People don't have to be journalists. They can do what they love to do. And when I look back to the great philosophers of the past who wrote so beautifully, Rousseau, John Stuart Mill, you know, they had to write beautifully because they had to sell to journalism or to you know, sell books to the general public because they could not hold positions in universities. Mill was an atheist and therefore he could not hold a position in a university. So I think the minute that people do go in indoors, so to speak, there's a big risk that, that it's a good thing that we're protected by tenure and academic freedom. But we should realize that that creates a risk of getting cut off from the general public. And we should work hard on writing. Now, the problem is, if I say to my graduate students, try to write for the general public, where are they going to publish it? That's really difficult. I mean, there are fewer and fewer media outlets for such writing. If you think back to Partisan Review and uh, journals of various kinds in the 30s and 40s, there were writers like Lionel Trilling who could easily reach out and just talk to the general public. And so, of course, they developed this beautiful, lucid, communicative style. In my early days, I had opportunities to do that largely through book reviews, and that was still possible. So New York Review of Books, the New Republic of the old days before the change. And uh, I remember having a lunch with John Rawls, the great philosopher, one day in this little restaurant in Cambridge, Barclays Bur Burger Cottage. And um, I said, look, I've been invited to write something for the New York Review of Books, but it's a deflection from my serious philosophical writing. Do you think I should do it? And Rawls, who had a stammer, and so he never liked to speak in public, and he was just generally quite shy, he said, well, you know, I don't know how to do this kind of communication, but if you can do it, you have a moral duty to do it. And I still take that very, very seriously so that often if I've done something more specialized that I love, I feel now I have a duty to do a different kind of thing. And that's why I wrote Not For Profit, because I just finished doing a book called Frontiers of Justice, which was more specialized, and I loved doing it. But then I thought, OK, now it's time to give back and to do something that would maybe move the needle a little in the public debate. But to do that, you have to be ready to write in that way. So the problem is that if you don't have the outlets already, the way I do, fortunately, then what am I going to say to my graduate students? Where will they publish this fine writing that I would encourage them to do? There are fewer and fewer book reviews, fewer and fewer periodicals. Like I would say Dissent is one that they could still write for The Nation. The Boston Review I love, and I'm on the board of that, which are serious journals of ideas. 
So young people have few outlets, but I still want them to do that. And I think philosophers are actually doing pretty well on communicating to the general public because philosophers tend to be people who feel that call of moral duty. So if we, if we broaden the, the, the aperture there and we think about American democracy out in the public space and we think about what we've just been through over the last year as a country in this election cycle, the appearance of these extraordinarily deep divisions. Is there a way, do you think, as, as a political theorist and philosopher, there's a way in which out in these broader public spaces, those differences can be attenuated somehow um, and, and there's a way to have a conversation about the common good anymore or are we? Well, I'm an optimist and I'm an optimist partly because the two issues that have been most central to my work and in various ways my political engagements, that is uh, women's issues and, and gay rights, have made enormous progress in my lifetime. After all, when I got to Harvard, there was no tenured woman there, except one who was in a chair reserved for a woman. Now, it's still an uphill battle. And I encountered great sexism in parts of my career. But I have to say that things are, are a lot better than they used to be. And there are so many women doing wonderful work all over the academy. And, uh, you know, with gay rights, it's astonishing. Like in the, the, when I first wrote about gay rights, I did it partly because the gays and lesbians that I knew were not out and they didn't dare to talk about this and they didn't dare to, you know, come out and say that this is the struggle that we're having. But, you know, all of a sudden, this tremendous progress. So I do think that the humanities in two ways have a tremendous role to play. The first is civilized argument. In that classroom I described, people knew that they couldn't just hurl epithets at each other. There was certain structure and we set it up quite carefully and we did have to do things that went beyond the argument like, you know, have model ourselves as certain sorts of people who like each other, who listen to each other. And I also made quite a point of my own religious affiliation because I am a, quite a religious reformed Jew. And, you know, if they were going to play the religion card, I wanted to say, well, you know, what my religion says is that one of the most important things is to fight for justice for gays and lesbians. And so, so we had that kind of talk. But the most important part was that we believed in the structure of a rational argument. When people care about the structure of an argument, then we want to find out, well, what are you relying on? What are your premises? Now, it may turn out that the two sides may share some of the same premises, and that's interesting. And so we want to see where the differences kick in. And when you really get people analyzing an argument, they're not fighting. They're actually curious, and they want to really find out what is the structure of the other person's position? And then, of course, you want to find out are some of those premises factually false or not? And so all the traditional things philosophers do, looking for validity and soundness, I think promote civic friendship. That, that sounds pretty pie in the sky, but I actually believe that. And then the other thing is just imagining. Now, I teach lots of courses that use literature, and every two years we have a big law and literature conference in the law school that I put on. And that's because I think the imagination does help our understanding of each other. If you really engage with a work of literature that presents to you in great depth and detail the life of a group that you have not come to grips with in your own society. I mean, let's just take August Wilson's play Fences, which I just saw the wonderful film. Okay, so you come away from that if you didn't think hard about race before. I think you do come away from that play changed because you're not just deeply moved by the people, but because you're drawn in and you're deeply moved by these people, you're thinking, what was it about America in the 40s and 50s that made him end up being a garbage man? What were his opportunities? What were his limits? 
why couldn't he play baseball? And so all of those thoughts, and then this wonderful, strong woman, what's happened with her? Why does she not have a degree that would prepare her for any kind of employment? Why is she really stuck being a housewife and a, a support structure where, in fact, she's in some ways the most stable person in that household? And eventually, through religion, she does get a, a community that she can participate in outside of the household. So anyway, you start thinking really hard about what, how we constructed the world for African Americans in the 1950s. And of course, that's what Wilson is doing by having a play for every decade, just trying to move the race story along through the decades so that we see how far have things changed and what has not changed. So I think the imagination can investigate in ways through the bonds that we form with the characters we care about. It, it, it helps us move out of this purely oppositional mentality and see the world in a much richer and more variegated way. So much of your work is anchored in the deep knowledge you have of Greek and Roman antiquities and ancient philosophy. And I, I was reading uh, just a couple of days ago the introduction to Ang Anger and Forgiveness and that lovely summary that you put together of the Oresteia and the final act of the Oresteia, the Humanities. And it just made me reflect on the power of these texts still, yeah. and maybe more than ever. And I just wonder, do you have, a, do you have a, a notion of why these texts continue to resonate so powerfully? Another place where they've come up for us recently is in the work that we're doing with veterans. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, a lot of the uh, sort of the discussion and reading group work that we've funded is built around the classics, sometimes Homer, mm -hmm. sometimes other uh, classical texts or ancient Greek and Roman texts. So w what is your sense of why those texts are still so powerful? I know they're very powerful for you. Well, I went into graduate school was to study Greek and Roman texts because they were already powerful for me. Uh, I wanted to be a professional actress at one point before I went to graduate school. But it was because of the emotional power of acting in Greek tragedies and just thinking about these plays that I thought, oh, this is what I want to write about. And I think what I, you know, what I've focused on my whole career really is the question of people searching for a flourishing life and what are the different catastrophes that can get in their way? What are the ways in which we're vulnerable? And as human beings, we ought to be vulnerable because we shouldn't try to say that we can be self-sufficient or do everything that's necessary for a good life all on our own, but we need other people, we need political engagement. And so what the Greek tragedies, and I think comedies too, what they do is to show you, it's like a roadmap of all the ways that trying to live this rich, full life can go wrong. You could get into a war. You could find that you have members of your family on the wrong side of some political crisis. You could be raped. You could find that your child has gone crazy because of some horrible experience, she said. So all these things, one after another. And they're, they're a roadmap, I think, of, um, among other things, of women's lives. Uh, in fact, next year we're doing our law literature conference on war in law and literature. And my whole faculty troupe of actors is going to put on the Trojan women. Because the Trojan women is. I mean, it is a roadmap of women's lives. And it's still as absolutely vital today. I don't think there's any playwright who's ever shown the, the horrible trauma of rape in the way that Euripides does. Now, how did that happen? Well, Euripides is unique here, I think, because he had this keen interest in women. And, People would joke that he must have sneaked into the women's festival in drag. Aristophanes represents him doing that. But anyway, he, he gets it about what rape does to the spirit, what slavery does, and what also what amazing powers of resistance are in the spirit of these women 
who are determined that as long as they can speak and name their oppression and protest it, then their life still has meaning and dignity. So, so we're going to do that play. And my male colleagues are a little bit disgruntled because there aren't very, as many roles right. for them as there were in the, in the Oresteia, which we also did. But that's OK. And um, so we're, we're, we're planning to do that. But I think um, it's not as though there aren't many, many artworks in many other cultures. But I think it was something about the civic nature of the Greek theater, that all the citizens stopped working. They came into these theaters. It wasn't like a Broadway theater where you sat in the dark and you expected to be passive and to be passively entertained. But you're in this theater, amphitheater, in bright sunlight, looking at your fellow citizens, recognizing their faces, and thinking with them about the future of your city. And Aristophanes dramatizes this, where he imagines in the frogs the god Dionysus wanting to get someone to give good advice to the city, because hard times are there. And he goes down to Hades, because all the tragic poets are dead, and he has to choose one of the tragic poets. Because the idea is they are the ones who think through the problems that the city is facing. Now, I think very few cultures have had institutionalized theater that is civic in right. that way. Right. We certainly do not. Right. I, I do love the musical Hamilton, and I really think that does a lot of the things that Greek theater did by bringing a, a myth of the city. I mean, it is like our founding myth that they're bringing in, and, and Miranda dramatizes it in ways that I, I think bear comparison with what the with what Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides did, because they kind of update it and make it more modern. You know, so Euripides imagines Orestes going to plead his cause before the Athenian assembly in the Orestes. So too, Miranda has uh, actors who are Latino and African American playing Jefferson and Hamilton, and, and so it's like a retelling of our founding myth. And it is fantastic. It is uh, brilliantly intelligent. Uh, I'm sure I'll mention it in the Jefferson lecture because I'm thinking a lot about the depiction of envy and the the difference between Hamilton and Burr and so on. So anyway, I think that's the only example I can think of of a truly civic piece of theater. But you know, he did that in spite of the structure of Broadway because Broadway, I mean, still stops people from seeing it. You have to pay so much yeah. to see it, even in Chicago. So in the Greek theater, you didn't have to pay anything. You actually had to go. and You just sat there all day. And so I do feel like our the theater has become profoundly corrupt and dominated by money. And we, the only way out of that is through revival of repertory companies. And we do in Chicago, we are lucky to be a theater city that has a lot of repertory, a lot of storefront theater, and the media cover it and make it available to people. We have this Chicago Shakespeare Company, which really is very civic, civic minded, and is doing more and more to do things for for the city. So we have some advantages, but but I do feel like a rethinking of theater in this in this country is needed. Your argument in Anger and Forgiveness is about the civic transcendence of anger, the yes. transformation of anger into, into something else. I, I think what you're saying, or maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing you correctly, but does, are these modern forms of communication somehow fueling anger and making anger uh, less likely to be transformed? I think they are, because the, the thing that I find so bad about anger is this wish for payback. And when people just think, oh, I'm hurting, so I'll make somebody pay, that's usually just futile. It gives you the illusion of control, but you haven't done anything constructive about the situation. So it, it is very human to think that way. Your relative has died in the hospital, and first thought, 
I think a lot of people have is that my mother's died, I'll sue the doctor. Because you feel helpless and you think, well, I'm less helpless if I'm doing something active that makes someone else pay. And social media make that really easy because you can inflict all kinds of pain on these people out there or just by your venting. And yet, the thing is, what good does that do? Now, Martin Luther King Jr., one of my great heroes and hero in the anger book, knew that the job was to take people's anger, which was usually grounded in some real wrong that they'd suffered, and turn it around so that it faced the future with an idea of constructive work and hope. And that usually also involved a kind of reconciliation and partnership, because how are you going to build anything if you're just trying to make the other people pay? And so if you study his speeches, there's a very detailed kind of emotion map where he picks up where people are, their legitimate anger, and then slowly, very cleverly, he calms them down by first getting them to think, well, it's really like a bad check. So the question is, how can we get paid? It's not how can we put the other person in torment, because the person who's tormented is probably not going to pay your debt. And so then we move forward, and we think about images of hope and the beautiful images that that I Have a Dream speech are full of, come, of course, from one side of the biblical text. They're the prophetic dreams of brotherhood and reconciliation. He steers clear of the book of Revelations, which tells you your enemies are going right. to pay. The yeah, the angry part. And um, so the thing is, he could do that because he was a brilliant writer and a brilliant orator, and he had a mass audience. You've written several books and a number of articles on women, gender equality, the obstacles that women face with respect to achieving gender equality, and it's a clearly a hugely important topic in your work. You mentioned a little bit earlier that there had been substantial progress towards gender equality, true equality, but I'm, sh I'm sure I know that you also believe there continue to be obstacles. What are the fundamental obstacles? that we still have to overcome? Yeah, of course, I think often comparatively, what is it that makes the women, the progress of women, well, real all over the world, so sticky in a way that I think gay rights has not been so sticky. Uh, I mean, you know, 20 years, and all of a sudden, everything has changed for gays and lesbians. And we still have a lot of work to do, but there's still uh, there's so much progress that's been achieved. I think the problem, the obstacle for women, is that their lives are intertwined with the lives of men in so many ways that change at the very deepest level of one's daily life and one's being is required if women are to be really equal. So, you know, you got to think about your sex life. You've got to not think that because somebody's drunk, you can just go right ahead. You just, people used to think that way. And great sociologist Ed Lauman said that there was a huge gender gap in perception of what force is and what violence is. That men just thought, well, paid for the date, everyone's drunk, I'll just go ahead. And uh, they, they also thought that no means yes. And so, so that has not really changed. There's still a gap in perceptions. Women feel uh, much freer than they did. But still, when alcohol is involved especially, there's still a lot of sexual assault. And there's a lot of confusion about that. So that's one thing that we need to focus a lot more on what consent is and on the importance of affirmative consent. And I, I think that needs to happen not just in universities where we're making progress, but you know, in the sports world where, again, there's more attention to that than there used to be. But we still see that celebrities, actors, and sports stars, like that Stanford rape case that yes, you probably know, yes, yes. Uh, famous you know, undergraduate star 
in whom a lot of money has been invested because, of course, athletes are not so easily replaceable and people have invested a lot of money in them, they are allowed to get away with stuff that ordinary people no longer get away with. So we have to stop the idea that celebrity and sports stardom give you a free pass on sexual violence. But then I think even more sticky, really, is just daily division of labor. Uh, I mean, I look at my law students, and they're going to go into a law firm, which really gives them very dire choices. The academy is great. There's a lot of gender equality in the academy and in the way that household labor is arranged, in the way that child care is arranged. And, you know, my colleagues in the law world now take care of their children. They really do in the academy. But in the law firms, the demand for 20-hour days is such that, all right, you have to postpone having children, or you have to go on to that second-rate mommy track. Because they're, the men are not helping you do it, and the world, the work world, is not helping you do it. So we have to work on, on many fronts, I think, on just changing men's expectations as they grow up of what they're going to do as far as domestic work, child care, but also elder care, because there's more and more of that, and that's less pleasant than child care. It's hard, and men don't want to do it, and they think, oh, women will do that out of love, and they're, they're good at that, and so on. And uh, so we have to change the work world. I would like to be able to change the way law firms deal with young professionals. I am not empowered to do that, but I think there are a lot of people who are fighting on this front, and just as in the previous generation now, the law firms have woken up to racial equality. At least they're trying, I think. I think they're genuinely trying. They have to really get it about gender equality, that it means not forcing everyone to work 20-hour days during their prime childbearing years. And that's, you know, the men need to also have that freedom to help out when the children are born. And, and I see young people who want equality, and they're forced by the very structure of the jobs they have to say, oh, well, sorry, you better take a few years off. And that's terrible. And um, the, the woman's career is put second. And finally, you know, what we really have to think about is aging. Because women are living longer than men. More of the needy people who need care are women. A lot of those women are living alone with no one to care for them or else they're shunted into institutions. I would like to see a sensible aging policy, more like what the Nordic countries have, but they're cutting back, so it's fragile there. But where you can have in-home nursing care, you don't have to rely on your children, for example. I don't want to be a burden on my daughter. I, don't think my daughter wants to take care of me, but I don't want her to take care of me. And so I think we need government to play a part in having a health policy that makes nursing care available for the increasing numbers of us who are going to at some point need it. Martha, thank you again for this wonderful conversation, and thank you again for accepting our invitation to be the Jefferson Lecturer in 2017. We can't wait to hear you. Thanks so much, bro. I really enjoyed this conversation. And I look forward very much to first writing and then giving the lecture. <laughs>